Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narriwarren South. We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and uh, transmitting by the Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV Digital Channel 1 in HD and uh, we may, I didn't check, but we may be transmitting on the BATC site the British Amateur Television Club video server I haven't checked that, it's occasionally there um, but uh, the video side of it, if you can't tune into the repeater uh, can be also found on my YouTube channel so just uh, type in VK3CSJ in the uh, YouTube search engine and uh, you'll find my channel uh, and look for the live symbol and you'll get to it pretty quick hopefully the internet will not fall over tonight I still don't trust it but it's been pretty good lately so we might be able to get through uh, tonight without any issues with the internet I promise to keep tonight's uh, session a little on the short side <laughs> Uh, I definitely went for a long time last week it's one out of the bag so uh, I promise to keep it under the hour tonight hopefully anyway uh, like I say you're tuned to the regular Friday night broadcast um, on 3541 been uh, going since 1988 and um, we also have an email address if anybody wishes to send reports to tonight's session, signal reports, whatever, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3 echo kilo hotel at gmail.com. And we're viewing the inbox as we sleep. Sleep. Uh, and of course, we also have a disco, Discord chat window uh, happening. And I can see we've got Kim, vk5 FUSE, already tuned in giving me the thumbs up already <laughs> and we also have Martin VK7JAH uh, tuned in as well I suspect signals on 80 meters should be good tonight because the um, the uh, prediction chart that I've been keeping my eye on is uh, been ever growing and or ever favoring uh, most of Australia or at least uh, half of Australia at the moment for this part of the band three to four megs so uh, 80 meters should be propagating very nicely uh, at the moment I would figure we have an interesting session tonight uh, just a bunch of short articles I've written like I said I've tried to make sure to keep it nice and short tonight but knowing me it, uh, it can extend <laughs> but we have something about lava tubes and something about neutron star a bizarre neutron star uh, and a little bit of an update on James Webb uh, Space Telescope finding uh, a little bit on the film uh, Oppenheimer and uh, something about UFOs I don't usually try to uh, make UFOs a, a thing here uh, but uh, it was in the news again so uh, this is courtesy of space.com since they've featured a, an article I thought well let's just throw it up there and see what happens so that's a little bit later on we have a re space weather report from a space weather woman she's come up with a, uh, a, 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 um, a weather report for this week it's already a day old but uh, at least it's pretty current it covers out to I think Monday Tuesday so we'll have that also screening before spaceweather.com report I don't usually go through the agenda like that, but I thought I'd do it tonight just to pan it out a bit. <laughs> um, all right. Now, uh, like I usually do, um, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about the state and the country and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to anyone with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy 
and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members, which it is doing proactively. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, coming up next Wednesday, in fact. And I'm, I'll, there's a, an interesting uh, um, talk happening next uh, Wednesday, which I'll just plug, give that a plug in a moment. Um, so, yes, so the uh, monthly meeting uh, uh, starts right on uh, 8 o'clock. Um, I mean, you can wander in late if you like. There's, it's not as if the door get cl gets closed and nobody can enter. Uh, but generally the meeting started at 8 o'clock with the intention uh, of aiming for a 10 o'clock finish. Free cups of tea and coffee and bickies so you supplied as far as I know. This still happening. I haven't been to a monthly meeting for ages actually. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, there's plenty of parking available um, in the adjacent streets and near the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Bird Avenue and admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory. Uh, receipt of the ASV's magazine called Crux, containing articles, news, observing notes and the like. And the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook, which, which gets published annually by the ASV. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan, the telescope loan scheme ASV has so members can try to uh, experiment with telescopes before they may wish to purchase one. Members are also encouraged to make use of the society's country property located just north of Heathcote um, about uh, a 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use uh, with the only uh, larger to with appropriate training, of course, they uh, which range from 300 millimeter to 1000 millimeter in aperture. Also located on the site is a 8.5 steerable radio telescope, which members of the ASV can be involved with, uh, with involvement with the radio astronomy section. Good evening to any of the radio astronomers that are listening tonight. Members are encouraged to make and use telescope. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. So there are, just going up here again, there are now 21 sections that make up the ASV. Uh, astrophotography, club section, comet and meteor section, uh, computing section, cosmology and astrophysics, deep sky, historical section, instrument making, juniors, juniors, lunar and planetary, new astronomers group, radio astronomy, solar astronomy, space exploration and women in the ASV for the ladies. Uh, so, uh, if any of those sections uh, have any interest to you, you can get in contact with the section director. If you go to the ASV website at www.asv.org.au um, and click on the sections tab, each of those sections that I just read out um, has a uh, separate page with information about those sections and, and the section director of whom to contact if you wish to pop along to a Zoom meeting or a national meeting. Usually uh, one or two meetings uh, free of charge are allowed, uh, but the section director is responsible for uh, at least um, giving you the indication that um, um, how to become a member. Uh, 
having said that, contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. But like I say, if you don't have the yearbook because you have to be a member to see the yearbook, um, all that information is available on the ASV website. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and notification of events are given in the Crux Extra and the Crux Extra is a email type bulletin sent out to members every other week to keep members abreast of what's happening what's coming up a separate little publication to the uh, actual magazine and uh, ASV will conform to all government health directives so if anything has to be uh, uh, stopped due to fire um, fire um, bans or such things um, ASV will conform to that of course uh, information if you want wish to write to the ASV you can send a letter uh, to the secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria GPO box 1059 1 minute to 11 just remember that 1 minute to 11 <laughs> GPO box 1059 Melbourne Victoria 3000 and one. Uh, anyway, so there it is. That's the uh, usual thing for the ASV, of which this broadcast is on behalf of. And uh, if you go to the homepage on the ASV, there's a revolving banner thing that goes that gives you a bit of an idea of what's coming up with the ASV. So we're a pretty proactive and active and whatever type society doing things, going places and all that sort of thing. Uh, now, uh, a quick uh, indication of what's happening next Wednesday night. Uh, here we are, finally. Um, you can find this under the calendar on the webpage. But uh, let me just confirm when it is actually. It's not next week. What's the date? It's the 28th of July now. So next Wednesday is the 5th. So it's the week week after. Oh, I could be plugging it the next week, next Friday. But it doesn't matter. I'll talk about it now because I've already got it factored into the thing. So not next week. It's actually the 12th. Sorry, I'm looking at July here. August. Uh, it is the 16th. Righto. Just making sure I'm right here with my calendar. <laughs> Uh, let me go. Pro, let me just go ahead one month here. August. There we go. So, um, all right. It's, so it's the 9th of August. Okay, get this. The 9th of August. The Astro Talk at the monthly meeting is the 9th of August. Which, uh, just having a look at my other calendar here, is definitely a Wednesday. Because the 1st of August is next Tuesday, so we're going into a new month. Just making sure I've got that right. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so the the talk is called, is about pulsars. Uh, it's a, a talk about uh, pulsars, nature's wonderful cosmic clocks. And... Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, the t presenter is Remy Mandel. Remy, R A M I. Remy Mandel uh, is a first year PhD student at Macquarie University, CSIRO, working with the Parks Pulsar Timing Array Project. He and the team study some of nature's most exotic objects, rapidly rotating neutron stars that emit beams of radio waves from the magnetic poles, known as pulsars, using Australia's loved iconic radio telescope, the Parkes Radio Telescope. And uh, in his talk, Remy will take us through uh, what pulsars are, how they form and what scientists use them for including touching on the recent use of the detection of gravitational wave background he'll also walk us through his current research on his favorite pulsar uh, which did something very unexpected in 2021 
So that's next month's monthly meeting on the 9th of August. You can go into Melbourne and sit in there and uh, listen to it personally, Melbourne Observatory, uh, or watch it on YouTube. There, there'll be a, a Zoom, um, there'll be a transmission, a stream uh, on ASV's YouTube link. So I'll mention this all again next week anyway, for what it's worth. So uh, I might pop in on that. If I uh, have nothing much better to do, I will uh, might pop in on that because I haven't been to a monthly, monthly meeting for a long time. So there it is. It's about the latest with ASV. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ. And welcome to everybody watching The Visions on ATV. I know there's a few out there. And also on the YouTube stream, um, which I'm not watching here, so I'm, I'm assuming it's all going to air. Uh, g'day to Steve, VK3SPX, who's tuned in and sent a message there on Discord. Um, <laughs> that's better. I was a bit worried there with your signal report for a second. Uh, we've got the uh, the VCL factor there, and uh, also Steve there as well. Yep, he says you're right about the band conditions. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Let's have another coffee. Okay then. Um, all right. Where are we next? This next article, uh, courtesy of Astronomy.com, is about lava tubes nature's shelters of cosmic colonization some say the natural formations are an answer to space dwellings while others aren't so sure in the realm of space exploration and potential colonization the concept of utilizing caves particularly lava tubes as habitats has gamed, garnered both fascination and skepticism Proponents argue that caves could provide natural shelters on extraterrestrial bodies like the Moon and Mars. Critics raise concerns about their stability and practicability. Either way, lava tubes have always been an intriguing feature for space exploration and enthusiasts. In addition to their potential as habitats for the future human colonization, Lava tubes can be studied to provide insights into the geological history of their celestial body. These features form when molten rock flows from the ground. As the lava cools and solidifies on the surface, it creates a protective layer preventing heat from escaping and wind from cooling it. Eventually, the lava drains out leaving behind a smooth and steep walled cave. Now I've got a, a picture here, which I'll bring up. And of course, this is not a, a lava tube photographed on another planet, but rather it is the Nakua Thornston lava tube, which is located in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And it is sublit by light, so people can go walking through it. And they reckon that that could look similar to those found on Mars. And there's a picture, or at least they suppose they claim, is a picture of a lava tube taken from orbit of Mars, which I'll bring up in a tick. But, uh, yep, there's a lava tube, perfectly walkable. And I believe there are lava tubes uh, uh, up um, in Queensland. Um, I'm not too sure of the area, but uh, there was a lot of volcanic activity at once upon a time in the place in Queensland and um, you've got lava tubes up there that you can go walking through I've seen somewhere you know the documentary somewhere <coughs> these lava tubes can stretch for miles kilometers in fact <laughs> the longest known lava tube on earth is 65 kilometers it's called the Kazmura cave on the big island of Hawaii. However, lava tubes on the Moon and Mars may be even longer. 
Most of these features likely date from 3 billion to 4 billion years ago, uh, when both bodies had frequent volcanic activity. Images snapped by orbiting probes show openings into ground underground voids, often called skylights, which most likely formed when the roofs of lava tubes collapsed. And here is one of these pictures. This is um, from Mars, the surface of Mars. Um, they say here that it's an empty lava tube in Mars, a, a location called Ar Arciamons region, taken by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And uh, otherwise looks like a black hole. But uh, there it is. They think that's a lava tube. So, you know, if you're going to land on Mars, that would be a place to, to sort of settle down and have a look. Drop a line, see how far it goes, and explore uh, underground. I think that would be most a most uh, fascinating thing. Anyway, to finish off the article. Uh, but, like I say, however, not all are convinced. Critics raise concerns about their stability and practicability. Advocates for cave habitats often overlook the practical realities and complexities associated with these underground structures. Pascal Lee, a co-founder and chairman of the Mars Institute and planetary scientist at the SETI Institute and principal investigator of the Houghton Mars Project at NASA Ames Research Centre, tells astronomy, Many proposals come from individuals with limited spell... Spell lunking. Now, it must be an American word. I've never seen it before. Spell lunking. S P E L U N K I N G. Spell lunking. Am I, am I pronouncing it right? I've never seen it. Anyway, with limited spell lunking, whatever that is, experience who view caves as inherently stable cavities. However, geological complex caves with potential risks of collapse and limited accessibility present formidable challenges, they say. Uh, Lee says that limestone caves common on Earth are often deemed stable and have served as improvised shelters throughout history. They are typically located in areas less prone to seismic activity. Uh, with nearby water sources, which make which made them relatively suitable for early explorers. However, lava tubes present an entirely different story. Formed through the rapid cooling and solidification of molten rock, the walls of lava tubes consist of glass-like material marked by jagged and brittle surfaces. Stresses and fractures accumulate within the rock during the cooling process, rendering lava tubes highly unstable and susceptible to collapse. Unlike limestone caves, which are often associated with the pro proximity to water, lava tubes have no such connection, Lee says. This raises questions about the practically of practicability of lying or relying on a cave located miles away from a water source. While snow melt could potentially provide water, its availability would be limited, making sustained habitation challenging. Furthermore, living at the altitude of a volcano dependent solely on snow melt raises concerns about the availability of sustenance. Examining the historical usage of lava tubes on Earth reveals a dearth of long-term occupation, even in volcanic regions like Iceland where such caves exist, the occupation has been sporadic and temporary. Lee says, while caves have a certain romantic allure, drawing comparisons to early human shelter usage, the analogy falters upon closer inspection. The practical realities of space exploration demand that habitats be, sta be established upon arrival, rather than relying on pre-existing caves. Unforeseen geological uncertainties and the impractically of using a cave without thorough engineering assessments make it just an unrealistic choice for initial settlement efforts. And robotic explanation can provide valuable data about caves on other celestial bodies, Lee said. However, even the most advanced robots cannot conduct comprehensive civil engineering surveys or assesses the suitability of a cave for human habitation. 
To truly understand the dynamics and risks of associated with these caves, we must explore them extensively first and studying their configurations, stability and potential for collapse, of course. It all makes sense. So there it is. Lava tubes on other planets. Oops, wrong one. You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. And as Martin says, spell lunking is caving. Uh, thanks, Martin. Kind of makes sense, I suppose. <laughs> spell lunking, my God, is caving. All right. Lots of lava caves in Victoria, Steve reckons. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know where they are, but um, I know Victoria is a very geological place, or at least it used to be. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's a lava tube or two around somewhere. Probably right un underneath me where I am. <laughs> uh, anyway, 26 past the hour. Um, okay, Bizarre Slow Neutron Star Challenges Our Theories About Dead Stars, published nine days ago, space.com. Assuming it's a magnetar, it shouldn't be possible for this object to produce radio waves but astronomers are seeing them. Astronomers have discovered a neutron star with an incredibly powerful magnetic field blasting out energy more slowly than, than any other ever seen. The newfound object is a type of neutron star known as a magnetar. What makes this particularly stellar remnant so extraordinary is that while its siblings blast out energy at intervals ranging from a few seconds to a few minutes, this neutron star has a more leisurely scheduled emitting radio waves at 22 minute intervals. 22 minute intervals, how is that? This makes the magnetar designated as GPM J1839-10 and is located 15,000 light years from Earth in the Scutum constellation. Scutum, Scutum constellation. The longest period magnetar ever spotted. GPM J1839-10 also blasts out bursts of radiation that last five times as long as those of similar long period magnetars. This remarkable object challenges our understanding of neutron stars and magnetars, which are some of the most exotic and extreme objects in the universe. Research lead author Natasha Hurley-Walker and an astronomer at the Curtin University in Australia said in a statement, and before I read the statement, what was the statement? Oh, okay, it's a link. Oh, well, I won't worry about that right now, but I have got an artist's illustration here, uh, which I shall bring up. There she blows. That's the artist's illustration. <laughs> a newly discovered slow magnetar, a type of neutron star. Continuing on with the article. Existence below the death line makes these neutron stars even more extreme. Like all neutron stars, magnetars like the GPM J1839-10 are created when massive stars reach the end of their lives. As they exhaust the fuel for nu nuclear fusion, the stars can no longer balance themselves against the inward force of their own gravity. And this results in their core collapsing and the outer layers of these stars being shed in massive supernova explosions. The collapse causes a stellar core with a mass around that of our Sun to crush down to a width no greater than the diameter of around 19 kilometers, about the size of the city on Earth, of a city on Earth. This results in a stellar remnant with matter so dense that if a tablespoon of it was brought to Earth, it would weigh an incredible 1 billion tons. The rapid diameter reduction causes the newly born neutron star to increase its rate of rotation, leading it to spin as fast as 700 times a second. 
All of this is wrapped up in the most powerful magnetic fields in the universe, 10 trillion times more powerful than the magnetosphere of Earth. It's little wonder neutron stars and magnetars are considered exotic. Not all magnetars blast out radio waves or spin rapidly. As neutron stars are as neutron stars age, they lose angular momentum and slow down and their magnetic fields weaken. That means older magnetars have magnetic fields too weak to create high energy emissions with this threshold referred to as the death line. According to the team behind the new research, GPMJ1839-10 is spinning slowly, indicating that it's an older magnetar and thus should have a magnetic field too weak to produce radio waves. In other words, it's below the death line, yet it lives. It's alive. Assuming it's a magnetar, it shouldn't be possible for this object to produce radio waves, but we're seeing them, and we're not just talking about a little blip of radio emission, Hurley Walker said. Every 22 minutes, it emits a five-minute pulse of radio energy, of radio wavelength energy, and it's been doing that for the last 33 years. So whatever mechanism is behind this is extraordinary, she says. Not only does this very existence of GPMJ 183910 challenge scientists' understanding of neutron stars, but it could mean this death-defying object represents an entirely new class of stellar remnants. And there's another little graphic here, which I shall click courtesy of the article. Uh, yep, there it is. And uh, in this diagram, uh, the diagram of Earth showing the location of several large radio telescopes. Oh, yeah, okay. So they're just what that illustration is showing is what radio telescopes can detect this particular long period magnetar. Um, Initially, even the team behind the first discovery was perplexed by their findings, describing the body as a uh, uh, enigmatic transient object that would immediately appear and then disappear, as well as blasting out powerful beams of energy th roughly three times per hour. We were stumped, Hurley Walker explained, so we started searching for similar objects to find out if it was an isolated event or just the tip of the iceberg. Between July and September 2022, the team hunted the skies with the Murchison Wild Field Array, a radio telescope in outback Western Australia. This search turned up GPM J1839-10. The team followed up their research with observations conducted with three CSIRO radio telescopes in Australia, the Meerkat Radio Telescope in South Africa, the Grant Grantesson 10 metre telescope and the Europe's XMM Newton Space Telescope. Once Hurley Walker and her colleagues had the coordinates of GPM J183910 pinned down, they set about scouring archival data from the world's leading radio telescopes to see if the magnetar had been observed in the past. It showed up in observations by the, the giant meter wave radio telescope in India and the very large array in the USA had observations dating back as far as 1988. The Curtin University researcher said that it was quite an incredible moment for me. I was five years old when our telescopes first recorded pulses from this object, but no one had noticed it and it stayed hidden until the data for 33 years in the data for 33 years. They missed it because they hadn't expected to find it or anything like it. The team will continue to investigate GPMJ183910 attempting to unlock its secrets while continuing to search for more examples of slow magnetars. The team's research was published today, July 19, in the journal Nature. So, how's that? That's uh, a slow magnetar. That'll be that'll be something to um, to try and detect. Twenty-two minute intervals. Very interesting. 
Uh, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH. Um, okay, next. And this is relatively short. The James Webb Space Telescope. Just checking my inboxes. Finds new planet forming rings around formal hut. An infrared space telescope has discovered the possible fingerprints of a planetary system in dust rings around the young star. Throughout recorded history, Formal Hut's main claim to fame has been its rank as the sky's most isolated first magnitude star. The luminary of Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish, stands alone on autumn evenings. A beacon in the southern sky amidst a smattering of less impressive suns. Then, 40 years ago, astronomers discovered excess, excess, excess infrared radiation pouring from the star. As scientists pointed ever more powerful telescopes in its direction, a picture emerged of an otherwise normal sun surrounded by a disk of warm dust. Now, researchers have discovered this new by star with their latest and grandest infrared instrument, the James Webb Space Telescope. JWST's images found not one, but three nestled bolts of warm dust surrounding Formal Hut, the inner two which had never been seen before. The findings strongly suggest that planets, that, that, that planets shape the debris disk. I've got a picture of it here. Stand by, just bringing it up. Where else is this image? Oh, you know, I've done the old trick of not bringing it across. It took half an hour to get this right, and uh, I left that out for some reason. I'm always doing that. Okay, there it is. Got it, got it, and bringing it across, and there she blows. Okay, so if you're watching RTV Repeater, and uh, my YouTube channel, you can see this image collected by the James Webb Space Telescope. Rather stunning. <sighs> and there's an another one here, which I'll uh, I'll just bring across to because I haven't done it. So I'll, it's it's this this other image is labelled. So uh, I'll just bring that across quickly, and I'll bring that up because it's got labels on it. All right. There it is, going back to the article. <clears throat> the modern story of Formal Hut begins in 1983. That's when NASA's infrared astronomical satellite conducted an all-sky survey for sources of infrared radiation. No one expected to see much coming from the relatively hot stars like Formal Hut, but there it was, a strong signal that could only mean warm dust likely a debris disk formed as asteroids and comets left over from the formation of planets collided and got around into their finer particles, into finer particles. In the decades since, astronomers examined Formal Hut across the electromagnetic spectrum, from optical to infrared and radio. The observations revealed a narrow ring located between 136 and 150 astronomical units from the star. Of course, one astronomical unit is, or, or AU, one AU, is equal to 150 million kilometres, i.e. the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That's where JWST comes in. With its infrared sensitivity fine-tuned to, to emission from warm dust and its giant 6.5 meter, meter mirror to resolve fine detail, the Space Telescope proved the perfect instrument for exposing the structure of Formal Hut's debris disk. The observations reveal that the previously seen narrow ring lies outside two smaller belts closer to the star. In many ways, it mimics the structure in our own solar system. The outer ring resembles our Kuiper belt, which starts just outside Neptune's orbit at 30 AU and extends out to 55 AU. Formal Hut's analogue stretches nearly three times as far. 
Neptune sculptures the inner edge of the Kuiper belt. Could an unseen planet perform the same task at formal hut? Question mark. A large dust cloud resides in this ring and faint halo lies outside it. The interior belts are a revelation, never glimpsed before these JWST observations. The inner disk appears somewhat similar to our asteroid belt, though formal huts again extends much further, from about 10 AU to 73 AU. Beyond this, beyond this is where it gets interesting. A notable gap surrounds the inner disk and stretches for about 10 AU. Outside this unpopulated region lies an inter intermediate belt that runs from 83 to 104 AU. More emptiness encloses the structure until you reach the outer ring. This gap likely results from the gravitational effects of an unseen planet with a mass no greater than that of, our, of Saturn. The belts around Fulmulhut are kind of a mystery novel, said University of Arizona astronomer and team member George Reich in a press release. Where are the planets? Question mark. I think it's not a very big leap to say there's probably a real interesting planetary system around that star. Team member Shiloh Wolf of the University of Arizona adds, We definitely didn't expect the more complex structure with the second intermediate belt and the broader asteroid belt, he says. Indeed, our sun doesn't have anything like these, this two-tiered asteroid belt, and so far, these are the only two stars studied at this level of detail, leaving astronomers to wonder which architecture might be more common. The team plans to observe two other dust-wrapped stars in Vega and Epsilon and Arendi in the near future to find out. <sighs> okay. Thank you to astronomy.com for that one. All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Now, some of you Oh, that's right. Some of you might have noticed a bit of a promotion for a film called Oppenheimer. Space.com has a little bit of a write-up published seven days ago. Um, I don't think it will take me too long to get through it. <laughs> but there's a bit there to say. <clears throat> and there's a picture here. Kind of a, a sketch thing. I'll just bring that up. And I also have something else to show. Uh, was Oppenheimer the father of the atomic bomb? Also the father of black holes? Question mark. The theoretical physicists conducted research into black holes before their discovery. Before becoming the father of the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer made a significant contribution to the science of black holes. Oppenheimer will forever, for better or for worse, be associated with the incredible destructive power of the atomic bomb and the image of the mushroom cloud, a near biblical symbol of destruction. That association will only strengthen in the public eye with today's release of Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan, highly anticipated biopic, bi biopic about the physicist. But before journeying to Los Alamos, New Mexico, in 1942, to contribute to the development of the atomic bomb, Oppenheimer was a theoretical physicist focusing on quantum physics. In 1939, he and his University of California, Berkeley colleague Hartland S. Snyder, published a pioneering paper entitled Our Continued Gravitational Contraction, which used the equations of Albert Einstein's theory of gravity and general relativity to show how black holes could be born. Interesting. Oppenheimer proposed the very first collapse model to describe how a star could collapse into a black hole. Excavia Clement, a professor of physics at the University of Sussex in England, told Space.com, 
This model explains the formation of black holes as a dynamical astrophysical process, the final stage of the evolution of heavy enough stars. This model is still being used today. Interesting. Kalmut said that he recently used the model himself in a paper describing the collapse of a black hole when considering quantum gravity. This model is very significant because it's analytical solvable sol solving the equations can be done with pen and paper and does not require numeral work. All the physics is thus easily trackable, he said. Yet despite its simplicity and maybe even crudeness, it is complex enough to describe many of the features of a collapsing star. Ironically, as Oppenheyer and Schneider worked on the paper, which so heavily depended on the 1950 theory of general relativity, the father of that theory, Einstein, was himself completing, completing research aimed at showing that black holes could not exist. History would show Oppenheimer to be right about black holes, of course. Eight years before Oppenheimer's theory of star collapse and black hole birth, Another theoretical physicist was thinking about what happens when a star runs out of fuel, or for nuclear fusion. When this fuel is exhausted, a star can no longer support itself against gravitational collapse. While the star's outer layers are shed to its core rapidly contracts, leaving an exotic stellar remnant. The nature of the remnant depends on the mass of the stellar core. Indian-American physicist Sabrahinam Chandraska released or realized that for stellar cores with a mass less than 1.4 times that of the Sun, gravitational collapse would halt due to quantum effects that prevent particles from squashing too close together. This would come, this would come to be known as the Chandraska limit. Chandraska limit. I think I got that right and any star below it, unless it has a stellar companion feeding its material, is doomed to end its existence as a smouldering stellar remnant called a white dwarf. That will be the fate of our star, the Sun, after it exhausts the hydrogen at its core in around 5 billion years. For stellar cores at least 1.4 times more massive than the Sun, there is enough pressure and thus heat generated during gravitational collapse that further bouts of nuclear fusion can be triggered with the helium created by fusion of hydrogen itself forging heavier elements like nitrogen, oxygen and carbon. The most massive stars undergo a series of these collapse and bouts for nu of nuclear fusion but Oppenheimer and his students wanted to know where this gravitational collapse path leads and thus what is final state of the universe's biggest stars. This answer had already been de delivered by a German physicist in 1916. Oppenheimer just had to find out how to get there. In 1915, while serving on the front of the German army during the First World War, Astronomer Karl Schwarzschild uh, got his hands on a copy of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Outstandingly, and to the shock of Einstein, under these incredible harsh conditions, Schwarzschild managed to calculate an exact mathematical solution to find to field equations of general relativity. In these solutions, in these solutions lurked two disturbing things places known as singularities where physics as we know it completely breaks down. These singularities indicate the existence of drop objects with gravity so intense that they could swallow light. One of the singularities was deemed a coordinate singularity which could be removed with a little clever mathematical manipulation. This coordinate singularity could come to, to, come to, to be known as the Schwarzschild radius the point at which the gravity of a body becomes so great that the velocity needed to escape its clutches is greater than the speed of light. This one-way light trapping surface is called the event horizon and it represents the outer boundary of the black hole. The other singularity, the true gravitational singularity, could not be dealt with mathematically. Nothing could remove it. 
So it was, and still is, the point at which physics completely breaks down, the heart of the black hole. That was the theoretical birth of the black hole concept, but it didn't say anything, it didn't say anything about the creation of these cosmic titans, just that they can exist. While Einstein toiled in 1939 to, dis to destroy his gravitational singularity and thus the concept of the black hole, Oppenheimer was delving into how such objects could come to exist. Working with his simple assumptions that ne neglect quantum effects and don't consider rotation, Oppenheimer set Snyder to work, and this paid off when the later, re the later researcher discovered that what happens, or what appears to happen to a collapsing star, is dependent on an observer's point of view. Snyder theorized that at some point, or at some distance from the collapsing star, light from a source close to the event horizon would have its wavelength stretched by gravity, a process called redshift, with it becoming ever more red. At the same time, the frequency of this light is being reduced from the observer's perspective. This frequency reduction continues until, for, a, for, for the distant observer, the light is effectively frozen. Oppenheimer and collaborators, real, co collaborators realize the story is quite different for an observer unfortunate enough to be falling with the surface of the collapsing star, of course. And an observer in this position would fall beyond the event horizon without noticing anything significant about it. Of course, in reality, an observer would be spaghettified by intense tidal forces caused by the difference in gravitational pull on their upper and lower body. This would kill them before they hit the event horizon, at least for the smaller black holes in which the Schwarzschild radius is close to the gravitational singularity. The concept was initially referred to as a frozen star due to the apparent freezing of light due to the apparent freezing of light at the event horizon. It wouldn't receive its more familiar and snappier name until 1967 when Princeton University physicist John Wheeler coined the term black hole during a lecture. Oppenheimer and colleagues may have taken a different path with, with uh, different path than Schwarzschild, but still the two, team, the two teams of physicists arrived at the same destination. The concept of a stellar body so massive that its gravity traps light and causes infinite redshift Schwarzschild had the theory, but Oppenheimer and colleagues were the first scientists to truly understood the physical birth of a black hole. Three years later, Oppenheimer would travel to Los Alamos, Alamos cementing his place in history and the, and the perception of the public. But many scientists especially remember him as, as the father of black holes. Oppenheimer made very significant contributions to black hole physics and the physics as a whole. Claimant concluded, while the general public may associate his name with the bomb and the Manhattan Project, his contributions to physics and astrophysics are well appreciated by the scientific community. He was one of the leading physicists during his lifetime and was extremely influential and his seminal work is well is still relevant today. All right, now that was much less to do with the movie. It's the first time I'd, uh, I've read it. Um, I thought it might have been a bit of a, a breakdown of the film, but it wasn't. Now I, I haven't um, I haven't seen the film yet, um, but uh, the only thing I will say is that um, it's probably worth seeing because we all know about the atomic bomb and Oppenheimer's dealings with it. From what I know, the film is more focused on Oppenheimer, the man. It's not really going into the physics. Sure enough, Christopher Nolan covers a few events in short moments, but the film focuses on Oppenheimer as an individual and how he got involved with the development of the bomb. So if you want to go and 